My definition of success is having your life on your terms. Mm. And one of my terms clearly is what I call cadence. And it's the cadence that I love. Now, I think you and I might differ in our cadence preference. Mm. And, 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 it's, and it doesn't matter, <clears throat> right? It, well, well, what does matter is, is it the way we want it to be? Right. right. And I had a former business partner who's also a former Tough Talks guest, as you are. And she keeps a, a significantly higher pace than I do. Her case is, but that's her operating like peak. That's where she performs at peak and she loves it. My preference is to have space, mm. is to have white space. And actually, more than most, most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey guys, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm your host, Chris Doris. And today we've got a cool, unique episode because what happened was a couple of people who follow Tough Talk suggested to me that we have someone interview me on, on all things mental toughness. So I thought that was a wonderful idea. And I, I asked uh, I, the first person I thought of to do it. I thought, man, I hope he says yes, because he'd be the perfect human being in my world to do this. And his name is Jason Goldberg. Jason Goldberg is a former Tough Talks guest. So I encourage you to go watch that episode. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, and I want to encourage you strongly to follow him. You are going to love this guy. I have a feeling we're going to be doing two things, at least one, laughing our asses off, and two, going deep. This dude is brilliant. And he really put a lot of effort in preparation. He surprised me. He, I asked him to do me this favor, and I wasn't sure if he was going to say yes. And he said yes straight away. And he started actually thanking me profusely, which was very humbling. And then he set a time for us to have a call last week in preparation for this because um, he wanted to be super prepared. And I'm like, dude, you are so over-delivering for this. So I love him for making this happen. I really want to encourage you to uh, follow him. Um, he's really prolific on social media, constantly pumping out incredible content. I don't know if the dude ever sleeps. Jason Goldberg on Facebook, on Instagram, the Jason Goldberg, and his website is thejasongoldberg.com. And uh, before we get started, as a reminder, uh, I wanted if, you know, if you're not getting notified, if you're stumbling upon this somewhere like on, on LinkedIn or, or somewhere else. Uh, in other words, if you're not getting notifications in your mailbox of the Tough Talks episodes newly released, then that means you're not on the list, and I encourage you to change that. Uh, in fact, if you go to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, or forward slash whatever the slash is, ChristopherDoris.com slash lists, L-I-S-T-S, then you can go there and actually get on both the Tough Talks list, which is also the blog list, and then separately the second list, which is the Daily Dose list, which sends out every morning at 6 a.m. your local time a, an email, right? That is a mental toughness nugget in 30 seconds or less. So you get all this uh, great stuff for free. And uh, without further ado, let's go find JG and let this party start. Hey, guys. Welcome to a very, very, very special episode of Tough Talks. Doris is already dancing, which is a good, a good sign if we've already gotten him dancing. Uh, listen, this is gonna be a weird episode, uh, not just because I'm here, but it's weird because we are changing up the format. Uh, you know, week on week, month on month, conversation by conversation, you guys are uh, able to see Chris Doris, the, the master of mental toughness, bring these incredible human beings on and extract their wisdom and help you see areas in your own life where you can thrive and give you all these different options of how you can implement and optimize your own life based on the wisdom and the experience of all these other people. But what you probably know and haven't gotten to experience on this show as of yet until today is that this guy himself is a freaking master. Like he is the mental toughness master and he's somebody that I look up to so much as a coach, as a speaker, as a facilitator, as a friend, as a human. Uh, any potential label that's a noun that I can put on you, Chris, uh, is, is something that I just, I look up to and I admire so much. And so this particular episode of Tough Talks is something that's going to be very uncomfortable for Chris. And it's, it's us making it all about him. 
because Chris is a guy who's all about service. You guys know this. He always wants to point it back out. He wants to make other people look good. He wants other people to flourish. And I refuse to stand by and let it happen anymore. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> We're putting an end to this bullshit. <laughs> so at least for this episode, Christopher Doris, this is your life. No, I'm kidding. Christopher Doris, this is all about you. So dude, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. And thank you for agreeing to let me do this. Uh, and to extract some of your amazingness so people get even a better sense of, of who you are and what you're about. Uh, I'm just so honored to do it, and, and I thank you for doing it, man. So, so welcome to your show. <laughs> Thanks. It's great to be here. And, and it, feels, you know, it feels weird for me to say you're welcome. This is like the most arrogant thing because I begged you to do it, and I know how insanely busy you are and all the amazing miracles you are in the midst of creating. So seriously, uh, thank you, brother, for making the time to, again – to serve the Tough Talks tribe, because that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure, man. You, you put so much service out in the world. So I, I'd love to know, first of all, though, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about us doing this right now? Just, I feel, this, this is, is fun as hell for me, man. This is really fun for me. This is, you know what this is like? It's like, okay, so we both go on stages. Yeah. And, we, and that takes an incredible amount of preparation. I don't know about you. You're an entertainer. <clears throat> uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of prep for me. So when I get to go sit in an audience, like when I watch you, for example, like at A-Fest, it's yep. so comfortable for me to know I don't have to do anything except sit there and make fun of you <laughs> and take <laughs> notes on shit that I'll rip on you on later. <laughs> and, I, I, I love and, that. And watch you do all the work. It's like being on holiday. So, so I'm having that experience right now because I put quite a bit of effort into each Tough Talks episode, right? I want to do a lot of research on people. If they have a book that they wrote recently, I want to read it and, you know, you know, the deal. And, Absolutely. and this is like, I'm just on holiday, dude. I just get to kick back. I, there was no way for me to prepare for this. I don't know where you're going. I, I am petrified about that part. Good. You should be. Uh, but really, it's fine because you're the first person in the world that I would want to do this. And so, so how am I feeling? I'm feeling pumped as hell and grateful. Amazing. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, and for me, I, I know this is, this is something where I, I know for you and, and you're, you're, I can say whatever I want, right? You're not going to, you, you don't care what I say. I trust you implicitly, Holmes. Oh, amazing. I might so, regret so, that, but at this moment in time, I, I, re, I, I immediately regret my decision on that. I trust you. You, will, you will regret it. You're going all in on the wrong thing. Okay. So, 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 so here's, here, here's something that I, I want everybody to know. Like, this is something that I know, Chris, uh, I know Chris pretty well. We've known each other now since, I don't even know what year, maybe 2015 or 2016, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's yep, yep. Been yep. Half a decade probably. Yeah. And, and, and Chris is just somebody who, for me, uh, you know, it was actually funny. You posted a, a, a post on Facebook uh, last week and you were doing this big talk. It was a Salesforce talk. You were at Salesforce last week, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you, and you posted something about being there and I was saying how amazing it is to see you on stage. And you mentioned something about like me and my energy and being all high energy and all this stuff and learning to be more of a performer. And that's actually the thing that I admire about you the most, because I remember back in the day when I was, when I was a rapper, that all of us would be like on the stage and we're like, you know, throwing our arms and doing all these things. And there was this one guy, this one rapper, he went by Adam. That was his rap name, Adam. That was his real name. And he would stand at the center of the stage with the mic on a stand and rap and barely move at all and captivated every single person in the audience. Wow. And that is a gift that I think is far more difficult than to be high energy and super over the top performer to get people engaged. And you have that, man. Like it's, it's just the way you show up in your coaching. It's the way you show up in conversation with friends. It's the way you show up in conversations with podcasts. It's the way you show up in conversations on stage. Cause I think, I feel like when I'm watching you, I have a conversation with you on stage, not like you're talking at me. And, and there's just something so beautiful about the, the grounded presence that you have. It's so sturdy, it's so strong. And yet it's still so captivating and so engaging and so compelling. And so I think that a lot of people look to you, just this is my own personal reflection of you and other people can listen in on this. I get to just love on you for a second is I feel like people come to you because you show a beautiful mixture of, of fulfillment, of success, of high performance, of ambition, while at the same time balancing that completely with ease. And, and that's such a beautiful gift. And if people watching this only get one thing out of this, it's that you can be very high performing and still live from a place of ease. And you said to me uh, when we talked recently that pace in your life is the mm -hmm. number one thing that you focus on. 
Can you tell me why that's so important? Why focusing on pace and not money or like joy or play or whatever? Why pace for you? Mm. It's funny that you're bringing that up <clears throat> because I mean, a matter of minutes ago, I was just thinking about that because right now, you know, I'm, I'm flying out to San Francisco in a couple hours and, and I have another coaching session after this before that. Right. And, and then I fly out and I'm doing a half day workshop, you know, a, another Salesforce thing from nine to one tomorrow. And then I've got two coaching sessions. So I am, Operating right now at a and last week was like the busiest week I've had. I you know there's, there's a huge kickoff, <clears throat> an annual kickoff, and I had the big keynote and then another presentation. So at this very moment, this is not the pace I love. Mm. But I, I'm gonna rephrase that actually. All right, so let's delete that. This isn't the pace that I would love to sustain. Mm. I love it right now because I know I come back Friday. And I can, next week is a back to chill week for me where I get to sit here in my home office and do some coaching with a few people during the week and have a nice, where I can create on my pace. So my definition of success is having your life on your terms. Mm -hmm. And one of my terms clearly is what I call cadence. And it's the cadence that I love. Now, I think you and I might differ in our cadence preference mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and and it's, and it doesn't matter, <clears throat> right? It, well, well, what does matter is is it the way we want it to be, right? Right. And I had a former business partner who's also a former Tough Talks guest, as you are, and she keeps a, a significantly higher pace than I do. Her case is, but that's her operating like peak. That's where she performs at peak, and she loves it. My preference is to have space, mm. is to have white space. And actually, more than most. So, so I suspect that if people looked at my calendar, um, people who, who really don't get um, maybe or don't have the pace that they want in life, they would look at it and perhaps think I'm lazy. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but I know that I am at my most productive when I have plenty of white space. Now, and I can go for a little, I can go for a couple, three weeks maybe, like hauling ass, knowing mm -hmm. that that's gonna end soon, right? So I can get back to my pace because that is when I know I can serve. I will have, that's when I can serve at peak, right? Mm -hmm. That's when I am my best and there's nothing more important to me in the world. This is my legacy, I'm not gonna have kids. So my legacy is my, is my contribution. So this is like this is that like this means as much to me as I imagine kids do to you know to parents. <clears throat> I can't know it, but I, I'm, I'm imagining that right. So um, I will happily sacrifice extra earnings, you know, extra income to have my perfect pace. Mm -hmm. So I know that I feel great. So I wake up and I, I feel successful every day because my life is on my terms. I love that man. Life on your terms, it's, it's, so, it's so powerful, especially because I think we're brought up with this belief in society that life can't be on our terms, that either that's, we don't deserve that or it's selfish or it's just not possible. So, so I, I love that you do that. And I'm curious, for you, does, when you have these, uh, these variations in your pace where it kind of goes from more chill and ease to having this kind of more a period of maybe some intensity for a little while, even if it's just for a week or whatever, is that the place that for you, mental toughness comes in the most? to be able to like stay in that place of service or sustain your energy? Like how does mental toughness change when you're in a chill pace versus when you're in an intense pace? Yeah, that's huge. So yes is the answer. I definitely need more. I need to walk my talk more. Like these are the moments why the, like the mundane practice is so important, right? So it's just like, you know, when you're working out physically, how, how important do you go home and brag to your friends about the, the amazing nature of that set of pushups you did? No. It's just exercise, but maybe the word just doesn't belong there. It's exercise, the product of which with repetition, you are now prepared for an event where you will not like falter, you won't hurt where you might have otherwise, right? In a situation that requires some physical strength or conditioning. And it's the same thing here. So this is a period of time for me that definitely requires mental conditioning in order for me to be able to still provide for like people that are gonna be in this room that I'm going to tomorrow <clears throat> to visit for an entire half day. It's a full, it's a half day of exercises and I got, and I, for them to get the value that I want for them, I need to be on. So if I'm operating at a pace that's like way faster than I'm used to, 
You know what, so yes, mental toughness is critical. And what that looks like in, in moments, in days like, like these, starts with a great morning routine. Mm. Like really, on, which actually begins the night before. The great morning routine begins the night before by saying no to like, you know, staying up for any other reason and getting, like stopping eating at 6 p.m. And, you know, I got my whole gig <clears throat> where, you know, even wearing like blue light blockers to maximize the probability of deep sleep happening and all this stuff. You know, a lot of which I'm actually learning from our friend, Laura Bolton, who's my health coach right now, who's amazing. She's also a former Tough Talks guest. Uh, and then starting with a really solid morning routine where I'm, where I'm real, you know, with some meditation and some stretching, right? And, and some bulletproof coffee. You yeah. rock. Standard <laughs> operating procedure. Always. Yeah. And some imagery, that. you know, doing some imagery of the event. So, so there's like, you know, doing, doing things on purpose to maximize the probability of not doing a good job because that's bullshit. That's an egoic, like that's, you know, it, it's about um, delivering. Like I'm a servant, I'm the delivery man. And I need to know that when I left there, I delivered. And it's, mm -hmm. not, it's for them. Again, that's my legacy, right? So that's yeah. I, I love that. And it's, it's, it's so cool too, because it's, it really is focusing on the inputs, right? And, that, and that's, I'm guessing that has to be a part of, of mental toughness is to not be directing your energy towards things that you literally have zero control over and instead just focusing on where you can be super purposeful about your inputs. Is and that, you, is that and you know what, what is another huge distinction that, that, that I'm constantly sh practicing is shifting out of the, oh, I have to go give this talk today to the, I get to, and having that be real, not having that be some stupid kumbaya sentence. Having that be an actual, the language is just the tool that I use to make the actual internal shift mm. from an obligation to a privilege, right? F from, from like an obligation to a, like a, to a party. <laughs> like I get to go, and like actually having that become the truth, which is I get to go chill. Like last week it was I get, to, and I, I, was, I was sitting in my, I had a lot of time before my keynote last mm -hmm. week. And I, I, I have never prepared as much for anything in my life than I did for that. I had like 60 hours of prep time for that 90 minute talk. Wow. And <clears throat> yeah, and, and I'm still prepping in the room. I'm like, CD, dude, you, you know, God, stop. Like, if you don't have it now, Holmes, <laughs> you know, I mean, you got this, you got this. And, I, and I, kept, I was noticing that I was getting nervous. I was creating nervousness for myself. And I, and I heard recently, you know, and this is part of the mental toughness, uh, practice. I, my mor part of my morning routine is I take walks in the sunlight in the morning and to get the hormonal cascade. And I listen to um, podcasts. And I was listening to Deepak Chopra as a guest on, on someone's podcast. And, uh, and he said something really that, that fascinating that stuck with me, which is that you know, if you want to get rid of anxiety, stop thinking about yourself. Mm. You know, so, <clears throat> so what I, what I, when I notice myself creating nervousness like that day before the keynote, or even if I happen to do that tomorrow morning before I go in and do a four hour workshop, which is significantly less likely to occur, but the only way it would ever occur is if I'm getting into my own ego and, and arrogantly thinking that somehow this is about me and doing a good job and having them like me as if that's what anyone would give a shit about. Mm. Right? And switching back into, uh, I get to serve. Nervous cannot exist in service. Mm. Ooh, I love that. Nervous cannot exist in service. That is, I love it because it rhymes more than, I don't even care about the content of it, just the fact that it rhymes. It rhymes, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, all, that's all that matters. No, no, I, I really love that though. And, and that was actually, you kind of brought that home for me because, you know, the, the if I'm playing devil's advocate, which I, I, I actually despise that term, but I just said it anyways. If I'm playing devil's advocate. Why do you despise like, that term? What is it? Why do you despise the term devil's advocate? Because why not just say, hey, so I'm curious if this is really true. Like, why do I have to like embody the devil and make okay. myself an advocate for Satan oh, the in devil. order to ask a terrifying question? Yeah, it just seems very intense. That, do you, which one do you hate more, playing devil's advocate or being dead serious? Ooh, dead serious. Well, see, anytime I hear dead serious now, I think of Sadhguru, where he says, you can, you can choose one, either be devil or serious. <laughs> That's good. I just love, but, but no, there, there's something in there. And, and, and I, you know, I think a lot of people hear the power of language, right? Like language is so powerful and, and that's such a small shift. Like I, I have to, or I need to, to, I get to. Hmm. And I think that a lot of people, at least in my world and even myself, when I'm really in stress response or when I'm really like this anxious place, 
to me that it doesn't feel like there's any value to doing that. I just change a word. What am I? I'm trying to like fool myself. Mm, mm, so mm. how do you actually embody that? So it's not like an intellectual shift, but it's a feeling shift. Yeah. So with practice, that's it. Yeah. Now, however, that said, I am uh, not a fan. At, so here's a phrase that I can't stand. Mm. Fake it till you make it. Mm. I think that's about dumb. Why? So that, again, that's putting off into, that's saying I can't be that now. I can't be in the get to servant mentality right now. I can't choose to be in that. No matter how difficult or even maybe insincere it might feel in the moment, I'm going to push myself right now. I'm going to, first of all, I'm just going to choose to believe that it is possible. And either I'm capable in that moment or not. It's totally possible and available to me. With, if, I, if I'm not capable of doing it, I haven't practiced enough <clears throat> for it to be real. So I'm not faking being of service. I'm not like saying the kumbaya nonsense. I, well, I get looking at life through rose colored glasses. If anything, I'm taking the glasses off. That would have me have the distortion of, of reality in the first place, right? To, to think that it's about me and that there's something that could go wrong. This is, you know, it's so fascinating how, how powerfully conditioned we all are to entertain these catastrophic futures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's so true. We're, so, we're such great creators, right? And in, in, in all shapes of the word, we're such great creators. And, and, and what you said there really, there was two things there that you said that I really loved. So number one, when you were kind of telling the story about that, it almost seems like the shift to I get to is because you connect it to what you actually care about. Like you care about being of service. So how would you ever use the word I have to when it's about being Right. So how would you ever, okay, so that's the one thing. Are you going to remember the second one if I interrupt you? Probably not, but it means it's not important. Let's go with this one. Good. So I think of like when, you know, when it's someone's birthday, a, a close friend of yours mm -hmm. and you got them a gift and you know, they're going to love it yeah, yeah, and you got it yep. and you can't wait to hurry up birthday party because yep. I want to give it to them. Right. Because how great is that when you know you got something that somebody's going to be like, no, -uh! and they're going to be so grateful. Right. That's an amazing. Everybody gets the gift in that moment. Like yeah. everybody's the winner, you know, because the reward that you get as the gift giver is has to be as valuable as the reception of the gift for the recipient. So that's that's where I want to go. Right. In, in moments like this is like the, in the get to yeah. right? is like I get to bring that. Uh, maybe not everybody in the audience is going to respond like, holy, sh if one does winning. Yeah. Right. And that's, a, and that's a big shift is shifting out of, you know, um, so now I don't know how, if that applies to every moment, but maybe it could, I haven't really ever thought about this JG, like, you know, say, you know, you're, so, you're not giving a speech, you're not giving a presentation, you're not going up on a damn stage. You're going to work. You're going to your, you're going to your nine to five. Is this still work? Like thinking I get to that I get to. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, I think if you focus on what you care about, right? So if I focus on like, I care so much about my family, I care mm -hmm. so much about them having a safe place to live. There you I go. Care so much about being able to go see and fly and see my other family throughout the year. Yeah. I get to go to work to support all those things that I love. And whoever, yeah. And the work, yeah, of course it's always possible. So I, I, yeah, good call. It's all, that's always available to us. And it's always available to us as the truth. And that's how you started this question, right? Is it like authentic or are you just saying it? it? And it is. And so like the only reason that we would even struggle having that be obviously true to us is because we've been conditioned away from it. Mm. I, I don't think as kids, like we, we, we experience, like experience life until we're conditioned to as like a have to obligation thing. Yeah. Did you have to unlearn a lot of that stuff for yourself? Like, did you have the conditioning growing up of like, victim or like this is what you, you do what people want you to do or you live life on everybody Dude, else's turn i still feel guilty man having this pace i'm not lying i i, I i'm getting i feel better <laughs> it's a slow process i i'm doing everything i can to speed it up but to get rid of like the shame like the thoughts the thoughts that i picked up growing up that you should be doing more you're lazy you're a lazy bum if you sleep in or, you know, you should be getting better grades. You should be, should be, should be. All this should, more should. And as Albert Ellis, like, said, stop shooting on yourself. And I still shoot on myself. <clears throat> you know, I'm just really good at catching it faster now. But it ain't gone. It's not gone. Okay, so, so that brings up a really amazing point, right? Because here's the thing. So 
I, I love your work and, and I want to talk more about like the, the principle of being all in and, and, and decisions versus goals and all these, these things that you teach and these powerful distinctions you teach. Um, and I would love for you to talk about, is it realistic? Is it a proper expectation? Is it something we should shoot for to be immune from having moments where we don't feel mentally tough, where we're, we don't feel all in, where we feel like we are still a product of our conditioning? Like, is it realistic to think that we never, is that the goal of tough talks and mental toughness and all the stuff you do? Is the goal to get people to be immune to that or is it something else? So when I, this is why this, see, I see you doing work Holmes. This is it. This is why I asked you to be the guy to do this. So good. So good. So I was, I, you know, I studied in India a while ago, and one of the one of the just the great things that occurred there for me is I I had the this at, you have a dosaji, which is the name for your teacher, right? That's your teacher who like sponsors you for the week and makes sure that you know you you know what's going on, and then and, and asks you how the day went, and then processes some of the learnings. So my my dosaji can, and they're all in their like twenties. They're these young enlightened Buddhas. They've wow. spent their whole life in self-inquiry. So, so my Dasaji, she came and visited at night and asked, so how was your day? And I, and I said, you know, I have a question for you. And I said, what is your definition of enlightenment? And she gets, and she smiles as if I just gave her, like that question was a gift. Like, you know, she was in that, I get to answer this beautiful question. And she was in no hurry. So she looks up at the ceiling with this big ass smile. And I'm like, wow, this is great. This already is amazing, a good answer. Like just watching her smile and take the question seriously. And I bet you 45 solid seconds passed before she looked back and with a great smile, like she was about to, oh, now I get to deliver the gift. Yep. Like having no internal conflict. Mm. Having no internal conflict. Wow. So uh, I have to believe that that is available to us, that that's an option. You know, Alan Watts, uh, one of my favorite Alan Watts phrases, he's one of my favorite teachers in history, right. is that each of us is an aperture through which the universe observes itself. Only the game that we're playing is to forget that and to remember that. Mm. So is it realistic? Uh, the term realistic is pretty useless to me. Uh, I'd rather explore is it possible? Mm -hmm. And, and I think it absolutely is now. And is that what I'm working towards? Yes. Feverishly. Eh, it can look like that at times, but you know why though? Because it's fun. Not because I need to, not because I suck as I am. It's because I get to, because yeah. it's a thing we get to do. Like yeah. it, we're, I believe that we're designed to grow and I'm like down for having less suffering today than yesterday. Amen. Me I'm too. happy. I'm happy to do a little self introspection, a little self inquiry here, and have that be like going on a lot, and having that become habitual, where I'm examining myself and how I'm experiencing reality, and asking myself, is it pleasant? Is it serving me? Is it having me be amazing? Do I like it? Do I want to manipulate it? These are the questions I like to be in, and I, and that doesn't feel like work, mm. and the and the payoff is so great. Yeah, like I find my, and I'm not in a hurry to get to, a, like, I, I love the, the progress. Like I, I just said to you, you know, I still have guilt about having such a cool pace. The guilt that I have, like now, the amount of it compared to 10 years, it, it's like, the, the, it's um, thank you for the work, right? Because it's so dramatically less. It's so dramatically less. And I spend so much more time now as a consequence of the practice in, grat in states like gratitude and enthusiasm, as opposed to shame and guilt. Yeah. So long answer or short answer, that was all the long answer, the short answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the question from is it realistic to is it possible? I'll say it is possible. Why wouldn't it be possible? Why not? Yeah. Dude, I, I love that. I love that so much. And there's, there's just such an element in there too of uh, why it's so important to make this a practice. And I remember, and you've already said it in, in, to, in today's conversation, but I remember uh, one of the talks I saw from you, I think it was an open text talk that when you did like a keynote for, for open text, right? Is that what it was called? Yeah, you have an incredible yeah. memory, man. Dude, but this, but this talk stuck. I mean, for the amount of drugs that you do, that is amazing. 
Well, I'm and on the drugs now. That's why like I can that. recall them. Yeah, I can recall Oh, them. it's state-dependent learning. Roger that. Good call. That's so smart. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been microdosing. Uh, what I do is I microdose so much in the course of an hour, it becomes a macro dose. So, um, so, so I, but I remember this talk and, and I remember you bringing up a really important point and you were talking about like how to practice mental toughness uh, when somebody cuts you off in traffic. Something really mundane and something really like, nobody wakes up and says, if today is the day that I can conquer getting cut off in traffic, I am gonna flourish. Like nobody says that. And yet you still focused on it. And the question became, and, and the inquiry that you, you invited people to consider, is that being able to practice mental toughness in the little things like that on a daily basis is the practice to handle the big things. We don't wait until the big thing happens and then start practicing it. You do it on the little things. So, so can you talk about like why that's so important to practice in the little things and not negate it because it feels little? That, yeah, that's a, such a great question. And that's when I, I, I started to reference that when I was talking about like what's the value of one push up. Mm. Uh, right, you don't brag about even the, that set of push ups. It's just, it's just some exercising. Right, and you don't you don't look at that as like incredibly valuable until you clump it, right, with all the other repetitions. Mm -hmm. Right, so so if scientists are right when they say that humans complain on average every eleven seconds, if there's truth to that, right, and I read that somewhere recently, and I want to actually operate from the assumption that they're right, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and take as many of those opportunities. As, a, as many 11 second intervals and practice upgrading my interpretation of reality, stopping experiencing pro, uh, reality problematically and experiencing it enthusiastically and opportunistically. I want to accumulate hundreds of those repetitions every day. So I know for a fact I am stronger tomorrow than I was today. The difference, one of the differences between physical training and mental training is you cannot overtrain mentally. You can't do it. You're not going to get hurt. And the, and the reinforcement is instantaneous, right? It may not be perceptibly in, instantaneous though. Like if I, like I catch my, I spill my coffee on my shirt. I go, oh, God damn it. Now here's an opportunity for a repetition, right? And I can do any, anything, I, even the catching of it alone has strengthened me, Yeah. right? Because what I'm doing is I'm, tran I'm transcending the content of my thinking and examining it. And that, that's, that, that's, that's metacognition. That's powerful as hell. You're thinking about your thinking there. You've already stepped outside of it, which is something that most people might never do is even exit their thinking and acknowledge I have thinking, but I am not my thoughts, which is so powerful. Right. But then I could take it to the next step and say, this ain't bad. Just is just as some coffee on a shirt. There you go. Now I've up leveled it. Or I could say, or if I want to go further, I could say, I wonder if I could create something excellent out of this. Well, look, here I am doing that already by even saying that. And, and that's growth. Right. So I want to accumulate as many repetitions of that as I can so that when I like this is a true story, I came home from uh, Malaysia from a trip to Malaysia one time. And uh, when I got home from the airport, my front door was open, not unlocked, open. Well, actually open, open. And I thought to myself, I, I, you know, I think I was drinking wine the night I left. <laughs> I don't think I was drinking that much. Why? <laughs> leave my door open. That'd be a lot of wine. So I knew I was robbed. Now this is fascinating because this is a moment where like, you know, when you train and it reminds me of a time, like I was training with my, with um, my trainer, Billy. And, and we were, and we were doing all these metrics. We were doing this wild, just measuring all the different, like if I, how much I could bench and all that stuff. And when I hit a threshold where I like did a certain, like 225 or something on the bench 10 times with no shaking, I, I looked at him like, wow, like, wow, that, I mean, that is proof that we are making major progress. And that, those are fun moments because you know you've grown and it's indisputable. Well, mm. this is one of those moments. I got home and I wasn't freaked out. And I was actually surprised that I wasn't freaked out, mm. that my house has been robbed. Right, so I walked in and just made sure there was nobody in there. And, 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 then I, and I was curious. My response was curiosity. Mm. And I was really fascinated. I was kind of looking at myself going, this is actually kind of cool. Like this is, I'm, I'm not freaking out in this moment because I've been practicing, you know, for years, sending myself messages all day on, on my, sending myself text messages through a system of things that I want to remind myself and remember throughout the day. Like this is the best damn thing could have happened is a mantra, right? Ain't bad, just is. Every set of circumstances can be, can be created from if viewed masterfully. These are things I bombard myself with daily. 
so then it became my response. They're all, you know, it's like, these are my, my, my lists. I read this stuff and I listen to it every day, you know, multiple times a day. It's me speaking my way into my truth. So my truth became, this ain't a problem. Let's go see what they took. I wonder what they took. And it was weird. They only took a TV and a Bollywood movie. Weirdest thing ever. Huh. It interesting. So, I know. Very specific. I know. Very specific. Yeah, very, almost, very, very weird. I almost wonder if they're judging your taste in other movies if they didn't steal those. Like, what's, what's wrong with Steel Magnolias? Like, that's what, why didn't you take that? That's, what, are you saying something about my choice in yeah. movies? Uh, but, but, but no, I, I love that because you're, you're and actually, I love what you said. I can't get it out of my head now is that it's almost like the, the path to, back to the question of like, is it possible instead of is it realistic? Uh, it seems like it's super possible if you live your life in 11 second increments. And in those mm. little 11 second windows, you just say, I'm just going to practice this for the next 11 seconds. Yeah. Well, you know, that story is like pathetic compared to the story we know about Byron Katie and the dude with the gun. Yeah. Like I use her all the time yeah. as, you know, like an example of what is possible with this kind of work. Yeah. You know, she, the work, she, that's what she calls it. The work. She doesn't call it mental toughness training. That's, that's my brand on it. Yeah. It's fundamentally the same, I believe, right? Which is questioning the way that you're <clears throat> interpreting reality. And, you know, the short version of the, that story is, as I know it, is that she, By, Byron Katie, for anyone that doesn't know, and if you're watching this as opposed to just listening to it on the podcast, this is a picture. This is Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is. Do you, have you met her? Several times, yeah. Uh, I have a big crush on her. Yeah. Uh, well, I can understand why, because she's so free from suffering. Yeah, she's love. She's pure love, man. Did, so let me ask you a question before I finish the little story here. Like, do you think that she's an example of somebody? Do you think she has transcended a fear response to reality? I do. And I think she's probably one of the only people in the world that I could safely say that about. So and which means it's possible. Which means it's possible. She says, I haven't met a thought that I couldn't love in 30 years. Just listen to that statement. It's not like I haven't had an experience that I couldn't love. I haven't had a thought. I haven't met a thought in the last 30 years that I couldn't love. So there you go. Like she's, she's my barometer, <laughs> you know? So the story is they're on break at one of her events. You know, she has, does these public multi-day long events and they're on a, a break out in the foyer of the venue. And the guy comes up there and he's crazy. He's got a gun. He sticks the governor rib, rib cage and says, lady, I'm going to kill you because you're messing with all these people's heads and, and you're stealing their money. So here she is, she's having her life threatened and her immediate, her auto response is something like, oh, sweetie, <laughs> honey, I, you know what? I don't blame you. I mean, if I were believing the thoughts that you're believing right now, I would want to kill me too, honey. Like that makes perfect sense. There's no fear in it. Because of the work that she's done, she is able to experience reality as it is in that moment, as opposed to being governed by her past. So what is true is there's a person that believes that she's being a total bitch. Mm. There's a person who is completely convinced in their mind to the point where they're threatening her life because she's so inappropriate to these poor people. And that person believes that. Mm. And she goes, well, I, see, I get it. Okay, if that's what I was believing, I'd act the same way. Right? I mean, that's amazing. It's next level. It's so next level. Yeah. And, and, I, to, and I think it's fun to look forward to, to, to creating, to getting to that level. Yeah, absolutely. With cadence. <laughs> yeah, the, for, yeah, absolutely. And, and, here, and here's the thing, and that's actually a perfect segue, because one of the things that is the most fascinating about you to me, uh, and, and, and I didn't want to start with this. I, I, I wanted to have the conversation we had, and now I kind of want to go back in time, uh, is, you know, there, there's enough of a challenge when we are in some kind of career for a certain number of years and we have a lot of proficiency and we've developed, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time and money on schooling and education and on working and figuring this stuff out. And it's a big thing if you're like in one industry and you want to change to a different industry, that's scary as hell to pivot like that. Say you've been in, you know, technology for 10 years and now you want to go be into banking. That's mm. a really scary shift. Mm. You made a shift that to me is even scarier mm. because to me, you went from really if, in just my feeling of this, you went from living from pathology to living from possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. You went from psychotherapy, mm -hmm. which feels very, you know, rehabilitative and, and pathological to possibilities. 
that is to, to have all the time and the money and the schooling and the internships and all these things that you had to do to then build a successful psychotherapy practice and then leave it all behind, you must have really felt some big shift that it was not okay to continue doing it that way and you wanted to do it this way instead. Walk us through that, man. How does that happen? Wow. Okay. I, actually, that, I, didn't, uh, I didn't think that's where you were going. I thought you were going to say the shift from working on a scalloping boat to being a landlubber and having the safe job of a social worker where I wasn't petrified of drowning uh, every day or getting shot by the toothless captain and crew. Separate story. So uh, this, yeah, this shift was, um, I'm getting a sign right here that says my internet connection is unstable. I'm being called unstable by my computer. Do I, do I look unstable? Yes, that's so. You look, great. you look amazing. Thank you. You look amazing. Yeah. I don't know about your choice of DVDs, but you look amazing. <laughs> So I, uh, I was, okay. So I had simul I had competing emotions at, at that time and the, the competing emotions were enthusiasm and panic, mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so the enthusiasm was, uh, that it was born out of my desire to serve faster. Mm. Simple as that. Like I'm not shredding, um, all psychotherapy, just like 99% of it. That's, yeah, that's, that's about fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. But there's like, there's maybe one therapist there out there doing great, great work at a high speed. And it's Marissa Peer. <laughs> <laughs> there's the one person. I, just, I just only needed how many people? So, no, yeah, but she's into rapid transformational therapy. That's her gig. That's what I love about her. I love that. She's like, yeah, I mean, we had that great dinner in Portugal and we just like the, all, the whole time we're just talking like, why take so long? Like maybe some healing, like super trauma takes a while. Okay, good. Then we'll do what it takes to have that, but not everything, and not, including depression. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's one of the worst gigs around. Scams is like, you know, the pharmaceutical company got having the world believe that they need to eat pills to get rid of depression and having them convinced to the point where they argue for it. Like the, the, like the, the, the people who, who are you know, diagnosed clinically with depression and completely married to the fact that they'll need to eat pills for the rest of their lives to be able to function. It's fucked up, man, in my opinion. So I, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people uh, on dep I do work with a lot of people. I mean, talk about it in my talks that like, you know, I don't ever tell anybody to just like drop your pills and get, knock it off. I said, let's start the practice of activating your own internal pharmacy, right? With the practice. So there's a lot of circumstances, like we can grow, as I mentioned earlier, we're designed for growth. Right? So, um, and, and the number one mistake that I have observed human beings for my entire career, whether it's, you know, social worker or licensed therapist, sports psychologist, or now, you know, life or slash executive coach, it's waiting, putting unnecessary time in between us and our desires, unnecessary time between ourselves and excellence. Mm. Right. And, and I believe the technologies in coaching are significantly more efficient than the technologies that I was taught meaning the technology is kind of a sort of weird word to use there, but it's the approach we'll say the approaches. Right. And as a therapist, you know, we were, we were indoctrinated to believe that it is an extremely gradual process. Well, I, I'm a, I want to be open to the possibility that there could be a quantum leap in growth. I mean, I've had coaches Chandler, Steve Chandler has had me have incredible quantum leaps in growth. A quantum leaps. Steve Hardison has had me have incredible quantum leaps in quant quantum leaps, uh, you know, like in a matter of weeks that, that you would have thought, you know, from the, from the, um, the paradigm, uh, the paradigms taught by, you know, counseling psychology that would take years, hmm. you know? Yeah. So that was the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and it didn't hurt that at the time, and I, I don't know if this is still true, but that, that coaching has just become, it was like this uber fast growing industry because people are just getting hip to it. Right. So that worked out well, right? And then the, the panic came from probably the same source of, of panic for all of us, which is the, the, the entertaining a disastrous future. I mean, that is where panic comes from. I mean, it is it. Like anxiety is, by definition, Th thinking of the future in a catastrophic way. 
whether that future is one second away or a year away or whatever. Just thinking about what could, could go wrong. And mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of that because we've been taught to. Mm -hmm. And that didn't serve me. Even that word choice, like I, I want to, I would love to pause you for a minute because we are, I know we're both so psycho about language. Even the word choice of entertaining a catastrophic future and, and the word entertain, when I first think of the word entertaining, which will probably be a surprise to you, I don't think of like an entertainer on stage. I think of like entertaining at your home, right? Like you put on a dinner party hmm. and nobody hmm. comes to your house and forces a dinner party upon you. You decide to entertain at your house. Yeah. Right. Oh, we love to entertain. That's why we bought that. We love to entertain. It's, yeah. it's such a choice. And you didn't say like focus on a catastrophic. You said entertain. Like there, there's just something really gentle about that, but also very much like ownership language. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to point that out that that's, that that's a really interesting distinction that you use that word. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And that, that, so that, it, yeah. So, um, no, thanks for pointing that out because we get to do that. And I like that you saying that that's a gentle thing. Because that's how I want to be with my thoughts. Is I want to be gentle. I also want to be really strict. I want to be gently. Help me with the language here. I want to be gentle with myself, but I want to be really firm with with the beliefs. Yeah, Something that like feels that. like sincerity to me. It Something just feels like, like like I want to be skeptical of, my, of of the beliefs that I may have learned that may not serve me. I want to be gentle with myself. So I know that every time it's a rule of thumb that when I'm feeling unpleasant, if I'm feeling anxious, like in this shift from counseling to coaching, uh, whenever I'm ever feeling anxious, it's because I'm entertaining uh, a, a disaster story of the future. And, and I get to, I get to delete that. I get to replace that. I get to, re or as Marcus Aurelius said, I get to revoke it. <laughs> mm. You know, I get to revoke that thought and, or love the thought like Byron Katie says. And, and come up with a new thought if I want that serves me even better in that moment. We are the creators of our thoughts. It's one, I mean, that's really fundamental to all the work that I do with people is, <clears throat> is, and my practice, my number one practice in life is, you know, I practice transcendental meditation because I think it's the coolest one that I've ever learned. It's just cool as shit because it's like, it's me remembering that I have thoughts in them, not my thoughts. And I don't need any of them. So I'm sitting in the transcendental meditation. I'm sitting in the practice and I have this great fantasy, right? Just this super fun. And I'm like, I don't want to let that one go. This is great, all right? And the practice is that, hey, you know, though, it's just a thought you don't need it. Yeah. And then and I, and, and I'm free to let it go. And, I, and it's always replaced by a sense of needlessness, mm. right? So I want to have that sort of like that willingness to let go of whatever thought that I don't need it. Right? especially if I'm entertaining or if I'm entertaining disaster. So the thoughts, they were easy to overcome. Um, I, I think over, over time in the transition from, from counseling to coaching, because uh, there was just a lot of opportunity. I had, dude, I've had unbelievable mentoring, you know, and I, I got to give away a boatload of credit for my career. Uh, so many amazing mentors in my life uh, that have really, I mean, maybe that's one of the most successful things I've ever done is create that, that level of amazing mentoring that uh, people who have helped pave a path for me. So that it was easier for me to make a transition like that than it might've been for, for someone without that, not that it definitely was easier than if I hadn't had those, you know, those mentors, those influences who kept redirecting my thinking back to the possibilities of service and all the people whose lives will benefit from uh, more, who will benefit sooner from, from the coaching contribution than my counseling contribution. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, so it really was, it was a question, it was a question of, of, uh, or a choice of efficiency. Why take so long to heal or to move forward? And maybe healing wasn't even the goal. Flourishing is the goal, right? And it's, it's not to get you to zero. It's yeah. To that's a good, good clarification awesome. point, JG, because you know, that was another part of the appeal for me which is that like I did a lot of, I, I mean, since I started my teens working at youth shelters, working on people with ameliorating problems. And there was great reward in that. But comparatively speaking, the, the enthusiasm and the reward that I get out of shifting away <clears throat> from focusing on ameliorating problems to creating dreams, fast, fantastic futures is super energized, way more energizing for me. And what I noticed was a lot of the shit that we used to spend a whole lot of time on in therapy became completely unimportant. Mm. 
Mm. Like we didn't need to psychoanalyze everything. I didn't need to always know about the relationship between you and your parents in order to like go create excellence moving forward. Yeah. Again, and and like with severe trauma, perhaps. With sure. per, yeah, right. With with persistent, persistent negative ideation, maybe. I think in most cases we don't need to psychoanalyze. Yeah. We create new stories. Old school psychotherapists would say that's denial. Mm. I say good. Yeah. Good. I'm denying shitty thinking. Yep. I'm denying that. I'm denying myself thinking that something was wrong with my past. I'm denying myself the opportunity to dwell in that. I am giving myself the opportunity to, to move on and create from it. Mm. With creative speed. denial. Yeah. Cre- yeah. Creative denial, right? Like denying it so that you can move forward. I'm denying that it was a problem. This happened yeah. in my world. I'm denying that that's a problem and I'm accepting enthusiastically. I'm loving the fact that I can go create from it. Yeah. That I, I can actually utilize it if I view it not from the victim mentality. Yep. And, and I, I actually love, I know you, you kind of, you were playing with the word, but like, I love that, that you call this stuff technologies, mm-hmm. right? Because, because, and, and one of the reasons I love it, I think is because it, it removes it from being this thing where like, I have to spiritually be enough or I have to have had enough of a certain journey in order to implement these things. Whereas for me, like if the iOS, if there's a new update on the phone, I just hit the button and it updates. That's the new technology. And then my phone works different. Right. I don't have to be anybody different in order to own a phone with a new operating system. So, so I love that you have all these technologies and these distinctions and that's, and that's what I love. I just love the stuff you teach and, and, you know, living above the O-line and just all, all the stuff you teach. And, and one of the ones that I'd love to dive into and just have you unpack more because it was another one of those things that really hit me uh, is, is this distinction of, of goals versus decisions. Mm. And, and when I heard that it was, it was so, so powerful in its simplicity that I remember actually like sitting there and journaling on it. For like ten minutes, realizing that just how powerful that is. So just can you unpack that a little bit and kind of help us see the distinction and why it's important? Ten minutes. That's a record for me. I don't think I've ever kept anyone's attention for that long. So that's <laughs> thank you for sharing that. No, ten whole minutes, like like full ten minutes, not like nine and a half, but like actually ten. Ten minutes of journaling on the inside. Just on the inside. Well, it's it's a huge distinction. Yeah. Uh, and so when we think about ourselves when we're at our most powerful, like if you can remember a situation, any event that occurred in your world where you're infinitely committed, if you can remember one of those, or hopefully as many of them, and if you can go back and re-experience them as vividly as possible, you'll discover that in those moments, you were operating from sheer doubtlessness the possibility of failure in the moment was non-existent in your field of consciousness, which is absolutely amazing. I mean, that is us in our like most powerful way, our most powerful state, right? When we are absolutely doubtless, you know, think, well, you know, you hear those amazing stories, like, and these are extreme ones, but they don't need to be extreme. Um, like of like a mother of rolling a car or lifting, a, ripping a door off to get her child out of like the car that, that they're in the accident that's burning, mm-hmm. finding superhuman, uh, you know, supernatural strength, right? And where does that come from? It comes from an absolute commitment. And, and there's no way that in that moment, that mother's going, God, I hope I can do this. Mm-hmm. I hope this works out. <laughs> like, right, there is no hoping. That's transcend far. Trans, it's a knowing. Mm-hmm. It's a knowing, right? And they do these fascinating experiments to 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 deceive like super elite athletes into knowing something that's not true, and then they perform according to it. Like they convince these weightlifters, right? These are like Olympic caliber weightlifters, and they have they create plates that look exactly like the weights in the gym with the numbers of how many kilos or pounds they are right? But it's way more, right? Than what it says, but the, the lifters don't know that. Yeah. And they're just doing warm ups with like weights that they would max at, maybe not max, but you know what I mean? And then they end up like, you know, there's just over time, these, these, these researchers are like, just they're, they're deceiving the shit out of them saying it has something to do with like rest time it has nothing to do with any of that, you know? And they're just throwing up these weights that, that are, and then they tell them what happened. And the guy's are like, are you kidding me? Why have I not been doing this before? It's because you didn't know you could. 
because you're expecting the gradual incremental growth as opposed to the possible quantum leap growth that comes from belief. Hmm. So that's possible, right? And then we, so if we just think of, so the difference between a goal and a decision, depending on my mood, uh, governs the way I articulate it. If I'm feeling peaceful, sort of Sedona-y, like not, <laughs> like not Philly, probably, you know, like Marina Del Rey-ish, Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, socal e, you know, <laughs> with grass juice and stuff. <laughs> then I'll say um, a goal is a decision awaiting its upgrade. Mm. If I'm feeling Philly, you know, a little more like, you know, Jersey Shore, my home. Yep. I'll, I'll say it differently. I'll say goals are for people who lack the courage to make decisions. Hmm. Right. And, and that's just, it's unnecessarily abrasive, but it's, but it's also, you know what, it's got truth to it. I actually believe the sentence is, you know, it's, it's actually the, the more appropriate way or, or correct way of saying it, accurate way of saying it is, is goals are for people that don't realize they have the same access to decisions. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. so, so when I'm just setting a goal. Like my goal is to have the best year of my career this year, right? Is to, to sell more, to, to, to crush quota, to, to you know, just to demolish it. Right? Or my goal is to, to um, make varsity basketball, you know? My goal is to start that book. Okay, that's cool. That's significant, significantly more powerful than being goalless. Hmm. Uh, unless your life is perfectly on your terms, in which case, what the hell is the point of a goal? What the hell do you need that for? Yeah. Uh, but if you'd like to create some stuff for yourself, then goals are weak in comparison because what you're doing with a goal is you're giving it your, a try. Mm. You're giving it a whirl. You try yeah. and you're hoping it works and you're entertaining the distinct possibility that it, it won't. And you're right that, that it won't, but you're entertaining that. And in entertaining that, you are minimizing the uh, quality of the action that you take. When I'm all in, the action that I take is so dramatically different. It's, in, it's way more instant, it's uh, way more bold, and it's way more intelligent, masterful. Mm. When I'm infinitely committed to something, I'm not waiting, right? Uh, I don't give a shit what people think, and, uh, and I'm smarter. Mm. So the bottom line, though, right, of all that is that what we haven't been taught is that that, that all in this is, is, is a choice, mm. right? Like if we go to Baskins and Robbins, it's not like you walk in and go, which of the ones here are, am I allowed to have? They're, like, they're all available to you. Okay, it's the same thing with human emotions or human states. And all in is just one. We just haven't been taught that it's there. It's just sitting there next to the chocolate chip mint. Mm. And we can choose it. Is that something that you personally are, or even with people you work with, is this something where you you're choosing all in moment by moment, or are you choosing it day by day, or is it like a one and done, you choose it and then you're in? You know, I'm going to say that this whole all in distinction is still new for me. I'm still a huge student of it and I have a lot of questions around it. Mm -hmm. So like even in my, my initial all in audio program, which I think I recorded seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. I still ask a question, is it possible to be in all the time? And I, and I said in it, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. But I'll be all in on trying. Yeah, I'm all in on experimenting with it. Figure it out, yeah. I got, uh, all in on giving it a whirl. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good that's paradox right there, isn't it? Yeah, that'll implode your mind right there. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. exceptional crap, yeah. Hey, it's an option to us. Like if, like again, that I have ever found my, well, I do have this belief that if I could ever do it, I could always do it. So, so, so I'm going to go with yeah on it. And, and again, I don't need to be there. I'm not going to create neurosis in my life again, that I should be, I should be spending more all, all time all in than I am. Why am I, I'm a mental coach for goodness sakes. Why am I not all in more? That's the bullshit learn, right. uh, you know, doubt, learn doubt or shame, self-judgment. Like I want to love what is right where I am now. And, and then if somebody was to say, well, then why do any of this work? It's because you get to, it's available to us. We're designed for it. It's fun. 
Yeah. I want to work towards being more all in, remembering to even and like to do that. Like when I go tomorrow, I'll be often I'll be in San Fran and before I in my morning routine, I want to get all in. At part of me, the way I get all in is I put my game face on, which is my full game face is warrior expert Buddha. I don't need the warrior element for, I use that for competitive stuff like golf, mm -hmm. but the expert Buddha, I will actually put myself into an expert Buddha state, mm -hmm. right? Which is a way for me to create the all in state, which is I'm all in on being tremendously of service and making it fun. Mm -hmm. And you do an amazing job with that. That's, that's just one of the things I just so honor about you is in all the things you teach, there's always that same element, that same element of fun and doableness. And, and it's, still, it's still all in. It's still, you know, it's, 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 it's action oriented. And yet it's, it doesn't feel like a, a shame based uh, action orientation. It's, it's possibility based action orientation. Yeah. I, I just love that. So when somebody, you know, in coaching, we're always talking about with our clients and how to create your desires, right? And what I like to say after we establish, so the first question is, what are your, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And the second is, are you willing to decide that you will have it? Mm. And do you understand what that means? Mm. Like deciding and, and, and we got to follow that up with this. The nature of this is a Chandlerism. He actually denies this. He, he, he won't take credit <laughs> for this, which is silly because it's amazing. I'm like, Steve, I'm trying to totally like give you props here, bro. <laughs> but um, the nature of commitment is, that it goes away. Mm. So I can get all in right here. And I've sat at this very desk and gotten all in on a lot of big deals in my life. A lot of like, well, actually deals, but also stuff like just things in my mm. life. And, um, and the nature of that absoluteness of commitment, it fades fast. Mm. So it's important to know that. So I can recommit, might recommit and recommit again and again, as many times as it takes as many times as it takes in order to make the desire a reality. It's huge. Uh, and, and for me, just the way you talk about it, when I hear all in from you, uh, it, it just, yeah, it just immediately registers with me what that feels like immediately registers. It's not like, Oh, well, intellectually, what does all in mean? I think the way you teach it, not just the words on its own, the way you teach it all in and, 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 and decisions versus goals. Like, it just really anchors in. And I, if I really truly in any given moment said, right now I choose, I decide, I'm all in, there would be no stopping me. I, I get that thousand percent. You know, so it was a, a year or two, two years ago that uh, a friend gave me the challenge of losing. I decided actually that I'm losing 50 for my 50th birthday. I got, we both have weight loss stories. Yeah. And, um, and I decided that I was losing 50 pounds for my 50th birthday, a friend of mine challenged me and said, why don't you lose it by your 50th birthday? And that was one month before my 50th birthday and I still had 30 more pounds to lose. So I said, okay, I'm all in. And, and it's funny because I said, I said that without knowing in advance how the hell I was gonna pull that off. Mm. And that is one of the major distinctions of being all in is that you don't have to see the how before you can know that. I, all I got to do is just stay all in and I will discover the how we'll figure that out. How are you going to do that? We'll, well, we're about to find that out now, aren't we? <laughs> Cause I just gave my word that this is happening. It's not a try. This is, it's, it's, it's a do it's happening. Yeah. Right. And there's a, so after that whole thing, I, I crushed it and it was amazing. It's one of the coolest events of my life, psychologically, physically, probably one of the most damaging ones, <laughs> but whatever, I rang the bell, you know, I can never, I can never unknow that I have the ability. Like, it's just another experience where I'm like, Phew. this is how powerful we can be when we get infinitely committed. And my life for that month was so dramatically different, but I, afterwards I broke it down. Like what? So I sat down one morning at my breakfast table. And I was like, what the hell I, did I actually just do? Because it worked. And I want to like bottle this, right? So, I, so it's like, what did I do? And it was six things. So these are the six components of all in this, right? Mm -hmm. One is decide. And that's what we just went over. It was not have it be a goal, have it be a decision. I had a formal decision-making ritual at the beginning. And I had that occur many times. So uh, decide, mobilize my army, right? Who are the people that I'm going to surround myself with? They're going to maximize the probability of success. So in this case, it was a nutritionist and a trainer, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, immediate action, which was in that case to call them and say, you guys, I just made a, a decision. I need you like tonight, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and also I started making the, the, you know, alters. I made a long list of everything that's going to change in my life for the next month. And I'm perfectly cool with it. So it's immediate action, right? Take, get on it now. Like, oh, well, it could start tomorrow. No, it starts now. And then the, the next is dedication. And that's so huge is, is choosing someone or something outside of you to dedicate the experience to. So now Iris, no, it's not just about you only anymore. Now you're doing it for someone else, which is like, now you're really accountable. I can't let them down. I got, I'm going to do it for them. And it's not out of obligation. It's out of beauty. It's out of compassion, driven by compassion. So now it's on, the, you're on your team, you know, and, you're, and, you're, and it's for something in addition to you, outside of you. Uh, the fifth is metrics, uh, which in that case is so obvious. It's just measuring the weight, but just coming up with some way to measure, you know, whatever the thing is that you're shooting, whatever the decision is that you've created, you know, so I just changed my language right there. I actually was using a language that was not all in language. I would say shooting for, I don't know if you caught that, but I was saying, you know, the thing you're shooting for, and I said, no, that's not the deal. So this would be doing the practice right now. Mm-hmm. It's like, not, not, we're, not, we're not shooting. Mm-mm. The decision, mm-hmm. right? So whatever the decision is, how are you going to measure it? Like, how can you say you're closer today than you were yesterday? How, unambiguously. And then finally, the last step is a recommit because the nature of commitment is that it goes away. So for that month, I probably uh, recommitted to the decision uh, thousands of times, thousands of times. Every burpee. (laughs) Yeah. Every time I'm jumping in the cold pool at 6 a.m., you know, in in April. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, doing all the workouts and uh, drinking. all my meals for a month mm. didn't chew anything for a month and being <sighs> hungry as hell at night and saying, and, and looking at the people who I dedicated it to. And then suddenly it's not a problem getting all in right uh, again and again, recommitting. Right. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the dedication one is just so huge because I had pictures of the people that I dedicated it to and, and I dedicated to two, two groups. One were the people I was going to go give a talk to, mm on all in the day before my birthday in New York. Right. And the other was the women who found my birth bomb. This is a picture of me and my birth bomb the day we were reunited. And those women uh, found her for me voluntarily. They volunteered to do it, to do all this work. So I dedicated that and I raised money for them. Wow. So it's like when you're, when that's on the hook, it's like, okay, well, this is who cares about me at this point. This is getting done. And this goes back to the stuff you were saying in the beginning about being of service and yep. like, you know, the, I get to being tied to the thing that you're know, being of service to doing something bigger than just you. And that's, that's a sentiment that I've heard you say all the way through here is that as much as, you know, all in and making decisions is about you and what you're creating, it actually really has almost nothing to do with you and what you're creating when it, when it works, it's yeah. about something bigger than just you. So I love that you're able to like weave those two together. That's amazing, man. I love that. Thanks for breaking down those. Six you're amazing. Too. Dude, you, you are next level amazing. Now, before we go, <laughs> I could talk to you all friggin' day uh, because I, there's so much stuff we could still unpack and I, I want to respect everybody's time so they're not taking a half a day off work to listen to this. But but there, there's a few other questions I, I got to ask you. So can I rapid fire a couple yeah, questions? Yeah, that's it. All right, cool. So what is, uh, what is one place on this planet you have still not visited that you really want to go to? Bhutan. Ooh, why? Yeah, because, they, because apparently they have the um, – the, what do they call it? The happy, they have some metric. It's like, it's like the equivalent of GNP, but it's like the happiness product. Happiness index or so. Yeah. I've heard yeah. It. And they're like the happiest in the world. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to go they experience limit. that. And they limit how many people get to come in. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes. Their entrance fees is actually quite expensive, but I want to go see what are they doing? What is it? How's like, what are you doing? What choices are you making on how to interpret reality? I'm down. I'll go with you. Okay. Number two, if you were not in coaching or, or, or psychotherapy or anything that's in this kind of profession, what would you be doing? Boat building. Boat building. What yep. kind of boats would you be building? I would, uh, uh, probably like really casual fishing boats on a beach in like Zen Wantanejo, like the end of, um, what was that, that movie, the jail movie? Where he Nothing escapes, John Connery escapes he escapes. Alcatraz. No, and no. Uh, wow. Great story, CD. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, I'll get to it. I'll think of it. He was all in. Yeah. Morgan, right, so Freeman, Morgan Freeman was in it. 
Shawshank. Shawshank Redemption. So remember at the end, he goes down. It's actually in Montanejo. And he's just working on boats. It would either be that or like super serious, like Viking sport fishing yachts in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. Ooh, okay. All yeah. right. Or That's both. Awesome. Or both. I love, yeah, why not, why not do both? Possibilities. Right. Okay, and fi- final question. Who would you love to play you in the movie of your life? Um, it, so, uh, again, I'm spacing on the actor's name, but I get confused with him constantly. God, it's just so annoying. Denzel um, Washington. Can we- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's way older than me. Um, <laughs> he played in Invincible. Uh, Invincible. I know this is so bad that I can't remember any of the names. It's not McConaughey. He's not nearly as good looking as me. No, not even close. Um, On his best day. He also years. is Invincible the name of the movie there? Yeah, where he was like a, an Eagles fan. He actually is a real life Eagles fan. Oh, oh, Mark Wahlberg. Not Mark. Oh, that was Invincible. That was Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, the no, wrong movie. But Wahlberg would be great to play you. Uh, he's a, he's a diehard Boston fan, though. Yeah, but he's not. He's not playing no, him. Like real life, in real life. Eh, how how him. amazing would it be? You'd be forcing him to be a Phillies fan in a movie. That well, that that well, that's what Invincible was. That would be that would actually be great. Oh, that would be really fun. It's a good point. So I could just go go and stand around and just like after they say cut, say that. You're not Philly at all. You don't know shit about Philly. It's terrible. <laughs> all right. We're getting Mark Wahlberg to, to get set up for this. Dude, CD, I love you, man. You are such a rock star. Thank you for allowing me to come in and do this and explore one, one millionth of the wisdom that you have in this world. Uh, and thank you just for the way you show up for me and the way you show up for your clients and the way you show up on this podcast. You're just absolutely one of my favorite humans in the world. And I'm so happy we got to do this, man. So thank you for, for being so open and for sharing all this. Well, you know, you're, that's incredibly flattering, brother. Uh, I love you like a brother. Thank you very much. I was astounded. So people know when I initially asked you to do this, you didn't hesitate. You actually jumped straight into, oh, my God, what, a, what an honor. This is a, you're doing me a favor, uh, but you oh, don't, don't even look like, make it look like that. Uh, you're not even thinking of it that, that way. And I know that you did a boatload of, of um preparation for this which uh, you know i didn't ask of you you way over delivered it's because i love you man thanks brother thank you hopefully we just brought some serious value to everybody yes i hope you guys got a ton of value and wherever you're seeing this let us know respond in the comments or reply to emails or however you're seeing this respond with what your biggest bradley cooper bradley bradley coop oh that makes sense i could see bradley cooper well that's just saying because everybody mistakes me for him I could totally see that. <laughs> I, I, I get mistaken for, for Lucius Cooper, which was uh, a dude I went to high school with who was not oh. nearly as, uh, as attractive. No, as but he's, Brad- I, I love his vibe. And he actually is in real life a Philly fan. I think he's he really? I, I would pick him. Okay. Oh, he's well, a diehard Philly. You see him all the time at the Eagles games. He's friends with the owner. He sits in the owner's box. He's yeah. a diehard fan. Okay, so I should cancel Wahlberg. And cancel get- Wahlberg. Cancel Wahlberg. Let's go with Bradley Cooper. Smart move. That, yeah. That's the move. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your big takeaway. There it Super is. Mark Wahlberg. All I wasn't going to let you hang up until I remembered that damn name. I didn't hear anything you've said for the last 10 minutes, by the way. <laughs> but I'm sure it was very flattering. <laughs> Guys, let us know what resonated with you. Keep watching and listening to all of the amazing Tough Talk episodes because they are incredible. Uh, I'm not saying that mine was amazing, but it was. So check that out. Uh, and, and just keep following Chris because the work he does is incredible. Follow him all the time. And I think you have another book in you very soon, which I can't wait for it to come out in the world. Uh, and just follow everything he's doing because he's amazing. I love Thank you, brother. brother. Thank you, brother. Peace. Peace out. What a guy, huh? You gotta love JG, man. <clears throat> so... Jason, thank you again for making the time and being so committed and thorough in, in your preparation for this and uh, for being so familiar with my work and caring. I hope you guys took a lot of value out of that. I think he made it easy for that to occur. And I, I want to strongly encourage you to um, to follow Jason closely. His work is amazing. You know, he's one of he has become one of my best friends in the world. Uh, um, and that that's... Let me make sure I say this correctly. Um, not, wait, I am not such a huge fan of his work because he's become one of my best friends. He has become one of my best friends because in part, I love the way he shows up in the world and his work. I don't know why that was so freaking hard for me to say. <laughs> I think after that conversation, I'm a little bit toast. Here's his book, get it, Prison Break. 
All right, vanquish the victim, own your obstacles, lead your life. Uh, it's like prison break, meaning breaking out of the prison of the conditioned mind, which is pretty much what we just spent an hour talking about. And he's got great stories, and he's, you know, he really is a true entertainer. He, you know, he said he's a rapper. He opened for Wu-Tang Clan. He's an incredible um, entertainer. I love watching. I go to A-Fest, which is a Mind Valley event, and I go to it each year, and he is one of the co-hosts, and it's just so fun to watch him on stage. My God, is he funny. He's just so hysterical and, and just clever, qu quick-witted, and, and brilliant. So it's one of my favorite things about him is you get to laugh and learn at the same time. So if you want to check out his stuff, his, uh, he's very prolific on social media, like constantly pumping out great stuff, great content. So Facebook, Jason Goldberg, Instagram, the Jason Goldberg, and his website is thejasongoldberg.com. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you stay for that whole deal, you rock. And uh, would love to hear your comments. If you aren't on uh, the uh, Tough Talks list, if you're not getting notified of these each time they come out in your mailbox, then that means you're not on the list, and I'd like you to be. So, uh, also, if you go to one spot, which is ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, put your name and email in there. And we'll make sure that you get on both the Tough Talks list as well as the blog list. Right? Those are actually one list. And the second list is uh, the, the Daily Dose list. So you'll be getting every morning delivered into your mailbox at 6 a.m. your local time. A mental toughness tip in 30 seconds or less, which is pretty badass. So I encourage you to get on those. If you enjoyed this, please share it. And uh, if, you, uh, if you so desire, it would be super cool if you would write a review uh, for one of the podcasts, uh, wherever you might hear it, on Apple or Spotify. We're all over. And uh, until next time, create miracles.